Hello, and welcome to the Cook Memorial Public Library podcast. I'm your host, Nate Goss. Today on the podcast, we welcome back Jennifer Barry, our local history librarian, for another edition of The Past is Present, our Libertyville local history segment. Jenny recently wrote a blog post for the library's Shelf Life blog titled One Man Town. The post was inspired by a quote Jenny ran across from a September 1932 True Republican newspaper article. We're going to have Jenny reread the quote in just a moment, but it revolved around a man hardly anyone in Libertyville knows about, but was integral to the formation of our town. So integral, in fact, that for a while, Libertyville could have been considered a one-man town. That man's name was Samuel Insull, and he is the subject of today's podcast. So let's switch over to my conversation with Jenny and learn a little bit about this Libertyville legend you've never heard of. All right. Well, Jenny, uh, welcome back to the podcast. Hi, Nate. How are you doing? Doing all right. It's been a while since we've done the local history. It bit. has been a little while. Yeah, uh, glad to be so, back. Yeah, I'm glad we can pick it up a little bit. So I know that this started with a quote uh, that you stumbled on. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about where the quote came from? And then obviously we'll have you share the quote with us. Sure. I, I don't remember exactly what I was looking at. I'm searching for newspaper articles on something. Uh, and I came across this article from the True Republican, uh, which is not a local paper. So it was somewhere else, I believe, in the state of Illinois. Um, in September of 1932. And I knew who Samuel Insull was, um, but this quote just really struck me in terms of his involvement in Libertyville and the improvements uh, in Libertyville at the time. Hmm. Uh, The quote was, The town of Libertyville, Illinois, was a one-man town, and Samuel Insull, once a powerful utilities magnate, was the man. Now that he has been expatriated, there is a gap in the community where he was once hailed as the dominating spirit of its material and spiritual life. For many of the 3,873 residents of Libertyville, life formerly was insole directed. They built homes on insole real estate developments and sent to an insole school children born in an insole hospital. They used insole light and gas, commuted on an insole electric railroad, banked at an insole bank, and played golf on an insole course. There's a lot there. and there uh, is. Yeah, and uh, I'm going to make my really corny joke that I yeah. thought, which is that Libertyville was such an insulated community. <laughs> well, it definitely was insult driven Yeah. And yet today there's no insult park. There's no yeah. insult building. There's no right. insult house, technically. Uh, so, yeah, what happened to this guy that seems to be so influential at a time? Yeah, well, okay, so that quote has like a lot of very specific things in there. So I thought for this podcast what we could do is maybe break down every piece of that quote and go into more detail of where he kind of touched Libertyville in its origins. Um, but before we do that, maybe you could give us a little background because uh, you do have a better understanding of just in general who Samuel is, like where he came from, how he got his start. Maybe we could start a little bit there. Sure. He was actually British. Uh, he was born in England in 1859. And after his education, he took a position as the London agent of Thomas Edison. Um, he did well there. Of and, light bulb fame. Of light bulb fame and many other things. And many other things, yeah. Right. Um, he did really well there, Insul did. Uh, and Edison brought him over to the United States in 1881 to serve as his private secretary. Many of Edison's companies were later uh, consolidated into Edison General Electric. And in 1889, Insul was made the vice president of General Electric. Um, and then wow. some... Yeah, the big names, right? Yeah, right. Names that are still with us. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, and then sometime later, Insul was sent to Chicago to head the company's two electric companies there, one which is called the Chicago Edison Company and one which was called Commonwealth Electric Company. Hmm. And in 1907, those two companies merged to form Commonwealth Edison with Insul as the president. And, of course, we still pay electricity bills yeah. to Commonwealth Edison I, today. Yeah, I'm very familiar with that <laughs> <Yes>. name. Yeah. <laughs> So big name in Chicago yes. in a lot of different ways, tied to Thomas Edison. But what's the Libertyville connection? Well, sure. So about that same year, about 1907, uh, he bought property just south of Libertyville, which belonged at that time to a man named Barr. Um, and over the years, would come to amass about 4,000 acres worth of land holdings just south of Libertyville. Um, There was a house, a farmhouse on that property, as well as several farm buildings, but Samuel Insull decided he wanted to build a larger house. So in 1914, he commissioned an Italianate uh, mansion or villa to be designed by Benjamin Marshall, who was a well-known architect of the time, and gardens by Jens Jensen, who was a well-known landscape architect of the time. Uh, It took two years to build. And then they moved into a pink house that we know today as the Cuneo Mansion. Okay. uh, Because John uh, F. Cuneo bought the property in 1937. 
So I mentioned earlier there's no Insel House. Well, there is. It's the Cuneo. But it's not mansion. called Insel House, yeah. right? <laughs> so so it was uh, Samuel Insel was Cuneo before Cuneo. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. And, and again, we've never heard of this guy, and, and that's where the, the actual building comes from. Exactly. All right. So that's that's kind of what brings him to the area. So right. essentially just to buy up some farmland and start a farm. Country house. Yeah. yeah farm. He uh, did kind of be – it was a gentleman farmer of the time. Um, I've seen some articles where he was very interested in actually the farming process and the techniques. And so it wasn't just a, a playground for him. It was something he was also interested in addition to his other work. Yeah. OK. Well, let's go back to the quote. So the first thing that the quote mentions is uh, how Libertyville residents kind of owe a lot to this guy, Samuel Insull. Mm-hmm. And the first thing it talks about is how residents built homes on Insull real estate. What, what's, what's that talking about? Is that the 4,000 acres they're talking about there? It's not, actually. Oh, okay. um, it's more in the village of Libertyville. And I have to say that uh, this quote that we're going to go through is not in chronological order. So we may oh, jump, okay. around we'll jump around a little, a little bit. bit. Yeah. Um, so the main real estate that they're talking about actually is what today is known as Libertyville Highlands, which is kind of at the intersections of Crane, Carter, and Rockland Roads. So in the early 1900s, there was something called the One Mile Track, which was a harness racing, mostly harness racing uh, racetrack. There were some motorcycle and car races there in later days. But Insel actually bought that property, um, I believe, in the 19-teens. The legend is that he didn't like gambling, and so he bought it and shut oh, it down. as I a way to shut it down. <laughs> right. I don't know if that's actually true or not, but that's, that's the local legend. Um, but he bought that property along with his son, Samuel Insel Jr., and a man named uh, Joseph C. Roos. They had formed a company called the Lake County Land Association, and they bought this one-mile track property and subdivided it in 1925, and they started building houses there. Um, they also had some developments uh, over in Mundelein near the Countryside Lake area. We'll okay. talk about that a little bit more maybe with one of the other parts of the quote. Okay. All right. All right. So he's got this land that's been bought up, and now he's, you know, so there's some truth to that, the real estate yes, aspect. Yes, definitely. Um, okay. And then the next part of the quote is that uh, Re- Libertyville residents were sent to an insole school. Now, there's no school now named after <laughs> there insole. Is not. So what's, what's the history there? there? Not. Well, Insole's farm was called Hawthorne Farm. And we do mm. have Hawthorne schools yeah. in the area. And you have to remember that although technically today Cuneo Mansion is in Vernon Hills, mm-hmm. there was no Vernon Hills at this time. And so the closest town to where Insul was living was Libertyville. So he would have been considered from Libertyville, not from Vernon Hills, sure. which okay. didn't exist until probably 50 years later. Okay, okay. Um, so there actually had been a school on South um, Milwaukee Avenue for some time since the 1880s. And as Insul continued to buy up acreage in the area, that school then became on his land. And then at some point, that school became unusable, and another school was built a little farther south. But most of the children that attended that school were the children of farmers or workers on Insul's estate. And he would actually have fresh flowers delivered from the greenhouses on the estate every day. Um, He paid for children's transportations to and from the school. So he was very involved uh, in the school. And, this actually, is, and this is – was it called the Hawthorne School? It was called Hawthorne School okay. at that time, yeah. Um, and then in 1919, that school actually became the first in Lake County to receive a status of superior school from uh, the state superintendent, which meant they met certain requirements. Oh, so it was a good school. It was a good school. I mean, it had some good funding, right? Yeah. Oh, right, right. That makes a difference, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, had fresh flowers, too. And so fresh flowers. So maybe it was that's really the key that nicely, we're not thinking. <laughs> nicely uh, turned out. That. When they received that um, – Insel actually was had been in New York but came back for the ceremony um, and said at that ceremony that the school was one of the joys of his life. So he really did take quite good care of that uh, that school. And then in 1923, Butterfield, Coon, and Hawthorne schools consolidated uh, and a larger four-room schoolhouse was built, which actually stood uh, in two, until 2004 hmm. uh, when some Hawthorne expansion was done down on uh, Town Line and about Aspen Road. Okay, so we've got real estate, we've got schools. Now the next part of the quote is actually about hospitals. So right. it, uh, it says children were born in an insole hospital. So yes. what's that about? Okay, so in 1917, a woman named Elizabeth Condell, which that name might sound mm, that familiar, rings a bell. Yes, yeah. um, passed away and she left about $20,000 to Libertyville for the purpose of building a hospital, granting that local residents raised another $5,000. Uh, So that money was raised by door-to-door subscriptions, collecting donations from community groups, and a dollar-for-dollar matching gift from Samuel Insull. Hmm. As well, Insull donated the land on which the hospital was later built. 
And he then served as treasurer of the hospital board when the li- uh, not the library <laughs> when the hospital opened up in June of 1928. The original building was torn down, so it's, that's okay, no longer so there. Okay, so that's not what you're seeing when you go to Condell. Right. They have expanded quite uh, some bit, and the original building has been uh, torn down. And then, of course, uh, they used in Seoul light and gas is the next part of the quote. I'm and guessing that, that has to do with the Commonwealth Edison tie. Right, uh, exactly. Yeah. Um, so you know, most of what in Seoul was involved in was utilities. Um, and uh, when he moved to the area— there was electricity already established in 1897, so he's not the one that brought lights to Libertyville. Um, but he did expand upon it. So when he came to town, the lights were only on from dusk till dawn. The electricity was only on from dusk till dawn. And around 1910 or 11, he built an electrical line from a power plant over in Lake Bluff and brought it into uh, Libertyville and some other small towns as a test. And because of that, about uh, 23,000 people received electricity, and also we got 24-hour service. Mm. And the rates lowered <laughs> for existing <laughs> well, electrical nice, customers. Yeah. So, right. So this was really actually the beginning of the um, electrification of rural America, especially in this area. But it did spread um, throughout. During that time period, Correct. you mean? Yeah. yeah. That's like the 1920s? Is that right? Or? Uh, it's the 19-teens. Or 19-teens, yeah. And, yeah, expanding after that. By the 1930s, um, he had assets greater than two billion, and his companies produced 10% of all the nation's electricity, not wow. just the areas. Wow. Uh, yeah. In addition to electricity, he bought up a company called People's Gas Light and Coke Company. We still have a People's Gas today. And uh, he founded a company called the Public Service Company, uh, which then opened up a public service company building in Libertyville, which is still there today at the corner of Milwaukee and Church Avenue. Today, it's the home of a Harris Bank uh, BMO. It opened up in 1928. Okay. And if you look at the uh, tower or the cupola that's right on the corner of Church and Milwaukee, you will see a P and an S intertwined. Okay. And that's public service. Company. Wow. It's all, all coming together. It all right. <laughs> uh, and then so speaking of utilities, you know, if you're playing Monopoly, you've got your utilities and you've got your railroads exactly. too. So uh, that was the next part of the quote that says commuted on an insul electric railroad. So what did he have to do with the railroads? Right. So there was an electric railroad that came into Libreville as early as 1903. It was called the Chicago. Milwaukee Electric Railroad, and it came in on a branch line from Lake Bluff. Uh, it wasn't doing so great in the mid-19-teens, so about 1916, Insel bought it, and he renamed it the Chicago North Shore and Milwaukee Railway, which most people would know as the North Shore Line. Uh, today, it is the North Shore Bike Path. Um, it ran electrical rail on that path until uh, 1963. So he invested a million dollars worth of improvements on the line, replaced wooden bridges with steel or concrete. Um, better power distribution, and by 1923, the annual passenger traffic had more than doubled. Wow. Okay, and then uh, banked at an insole bank. So so he's he's got his hands in the banks as well then. Pretty much. So this is one where um, I can't prove that he was necessarily – involved, except it was his son and some of his partners from the Lake County Land Association. So I would think that he definitely had some investment in it, but he was not listed as one of the directors. Sure. Okay. Um, So the Libreville Trust and Savings Bank opened September 14th, 1925 in what was then known as the Kennedy Block, which is uh, today has a Lovin' Oven in the downstairs. And uh, the president of the bank was Joseph C. Roos. We heard of his name earlier with the Lake County uh, Land Association. C.F. Thompson, who was vice president of the North Shore Line, which we just talked about, and Samuel Inso Jr. were a few of the directors. So um, if Samuel Inso wasn't directly involved, he definitely had relationships with the people who were there. Okay. Um, and then finally, residents played golf on an insul course. So there's right. a golf connection as well. Right. So I mentioned earlier Countryside Lake, which is out in Mundelein. It's just past today's Route 6083 um, off of Holly Avenue. And the Lake County Land Association bought a big chunk of land out there with the idea of developing exclusive country home sites in 1926. Um, And one of the articles I found said that a large number of wealthy South Chicago businessmen have already purchased several lots. Mm. Um, So the North Shore Line, the railroad, had extended out into uh, Mundelein. And so now here's some land that's about maybe two miles away from an electric railroad station. So getting back and forth to Chicago now was a little bit easier. Okay. Uh, for that land uh, out west. Uh, so uh, things were subdivided out there. And Samuel Insel actually built a hunting lodge on an island in the lake, which actually still stands today. Really? Um, As a hunting lodge? Or no, it's a now? private home. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. 
Yeah. So um, the Lake County Countryside Lake Association was established um, to improve the area. They dammed a stream that made a lake. And on the shore of the lake, a nine-hole golf course was laid out on Mm -hmm. the northeast shore. Um, And it became actually the first public golf course in Lake County. Uh, Today, it's run by the Lake County Forest Preserve District. As a golf course? As a golf course. Wow. Yep. So, actually, that quote's not far off then, huh? No. He really did seem to have (laughs) his hand in so much stuff. But, you know, as you've mentioned uh, a couple times now, you know, it's not a name that we're really familiar with. His name isn't all over these buildings that he uh, apparently had a huge part in in getting off the ground. So, So, what happened to this guy? Well, uh, he did actually survive the 1929 stock crash, which would have um, probably leveled other people. Yeah, okay. um, But he did have some heavy borrowing over the last next couple of years after that, which made him in a little bit of a sticky situation. Uh, and then his empire faltered in 1931-32. Uh, he lost everything as well as his investors lost everything, and he was accused of financial mismanagement. Oh, okay. And is this still with utilities that he was making his he was money? He mostly utilities. Okay. He was involved in probably some other business things too, but this was mostly utilities. He actually kind of ran away. Okay. <laughs> he went to Europe. Um, he was indicted while he was there. He moved to Greece to avoid extradition, but eventually he was extradited back to the United States and stood trial in 1934 and 35. He was acquitted of all charges. Oh, okay. That. Um, but I think at that point, even today, you know, the damage is yeah, done. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't good PR, I'm right, sure. Right, <laughs> exactly. So he never really recovered from that. Um, went back to um, Paris and kind of sadly um, had a heart attack while on a Paris subway and died hmm. in 1938. Wow. Okay. So I guess a, a big rise and then, a, and then a bit of a fall. I think he probably, for those who do know of him, he may have gone down as sort of a bad guy. Um, but really all the things he did up to that point, and he was not found guilty, but everything he did up to that point was just so suspendous for this area. Yeah, and, and, and had lasting impact. It, it, I mean, yeah, the stuff definitely. you mentioned, I mean, the hospital and the, the schools and all that stuff, I mean, still is, is there to this day. Exactly. And it's it's uh, really something. So I think one of the lessons that you learn from this, though, is if you want your name to have any lasting impact, you've got to stipulate that stuff gets called <laughs> your <laughs> right. name, whether exactly. it's Condell or Cook or whatever, right, right. you know. You know, and I don't I've not read a lot about Insol's personality. I mean, there's several books in the library that probably go into more detail and I've not read them all. But it's amazing for the things that he did that his name's not on things. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if that was just a part of his personality that he... More modest or I don't know. just didn't think of it. Or, right. He obviously yeah. was ambitious mm-hmm. and, you know, very good at his job. Um, but maybe in the public sector that he just, yeah. that wasn't his thing. Well, um, I wanted to have you maybe share um, if people wanted to even dig deeper, where are some places that they could go, you know, especially here at the library, if they wanted to look into Samuel Insel even more? Oh, sure. We actually have three books, and then we have a large clippings file in our local history file. So um, I would recommend we have the memoirs of Samuel Insel, an autobiography. Uh, we have a book called Insel by a man named Forrest MacDonald. And then a more recent book by a local author, John Wasick, called The Merchant of Power, Samuel Insel, Thomas Edison, and the Creation of the Modern Metropolis. And then are those books that people would have to look at in the library, or could they be checked out? Or? Bo- some are just in local uh, history reference and would okay. have to be looked at the library. And then we, a couple of the others we have copies of that can be checked out. Very cool. All right. Well, uh, Jenny, thank you for introducing us to Samuel Insel, and uh, thanks for being on the podcast again. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Okay, so if you would like to dig even deeper into Samuel Insel lore, we will link to Jenny's original blog post in our show notes, but you can also look at some of the books that she mentioned by perusing Cook Park Library's local history collection. That collection is located in the library's lower level, and a librarian will be happy to assist you. Or you can search for the books in our online catalog. Just head over to www.cooklib.org. While you're over on the library's website, take some time to stop by the library's blog, Shelf Life. That's where Jenny's Samuel Insel post is, along with a whole slew of Libertyville history. Recently, another Cook librarian, Joe Murrow, published a fascinating history of Native American peoples of Lake County. Don't miss it. That blog can be found at shelflife.cooklib.org. If you ever want to get in touch with us, you can reach us anytime. Uh, One of the best ways to do that is just to talk to us on Twitter. Our handle is at Cook Library, or you can always send us an email. That email address is webmaster at cooklib.org. If you enjoyed this episode, please remember to share it with others on your Facebook and Twitter and let them know that they can catch any of our future episodes by subscribing in Apple Podcasts or really anywhere they like to get their podcasts. If you're looking for a way that you can help us out, one of the best things you can do actually is head over to Apple Podcasts and just leave us a nice rating. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll be back soon. But until then, keep reading, keep watching, and keep listening.